Hi, I'm former Congresswoman Barbara Comstock. Welcome to today's conversation on the dangers of breaking up tech. I'm honored to be joined today by two great guests, former Senator Phil Graham of Texas and Robert Bork Jr., president of the Antitrust Education Project and son of conservative icon, Judge Robert Bork. And I wanted to start with you, uh, Bob, because your father, Judge Bork, really came up with the consumer welfare standard. And I was wondering if you could discuss that and why that's been so good for our economy and for innovation over the past decades. Sure. The consumer welfare standard is an idea that for competition policy to work, for companies to thrive in this economy, that there needs to be a, an essential neutral principle at work, and that is that the consumer benefit is the thing that we should focus on. Not whether competitors are being treated fairly or unfairly, uh, not whether there are winners and losers there, but who is really the, per what is the purpose of the law? The law is to create value for consumers, to maximize value for consumers, to maximize efficiency for consumers. That's what the consumer welfare standard so is. So it puts me at the center. It puts, like the t we, it we puts, are all the people it who puts are little the people priority. and big people and everybody individually and collectively at the center of competition policy. Okay, so it's not somebody who can necessarily lobby Congress or get some you know advantage for their industry. It's saying all of us, the consumers, Americans, um, well, the world market. Those yeah. are the priorities. Uh, so my father wrote the, consumer, the antitrust paradox uh, really to deal with the problems of antitrust law, which were that it was being applied by the courts uh, in a way that punished uh, uh, companies uh, that were uh, efficient and helped companies that were inefficient. Uh, and really he said this is not what the purpose of the law was. The purpose of the law, of antitrust law, is at its essence to help the consumer to pro maximize consumer welfare. And that was, a, uh, I guess, a novel idea that made its way to the Supreme Court in a case called Sonaton the year after the book was published in 1979. Uh, and it has basically been uh, codified by the Supreme Court in many decisions since. So that has, I think, been a vehicle with other things in the economy, other policies, for growth, uh, really gr more growth in the United States than in Europe or elsewhere uh, for innovation uh, and uh, you know, for creating jobs. That's what he was trying to do by putting that idea forward. Great. And Senator, when you were in Congress and the House and the Senate, you were known for being somebody you know, to get the economy moving and supporting innovation. So how is this consumer welfare standard really been a, a boom for our economy over the past decades, particularly since you know, the, the growth in tech? Well, let me go further back um, to the progressive era. Um, uh, the progressive era was an era dominated by thinking that uh, the modernization that was happening in America that involved consolidation of industries like the steel industry, the sugar refining industry, the oil industry. Uh, the sort of logic of the progressive era was that this was harmful and it had to be hurting consumers and therefore something should be done about it. By the government By to the re government. more regulation. Now, we know now, having gone back and looked at the 10 years before the Sherman Act was adopted and the 10 years after it was adopted and found that prices fell further, faster, before antitrust legislation than after. So I think the first thing to note in this debate is there never was any empirical evidence, especially after the fact when we could look at what happened, there was never any evidence of consumer benefit from antitrust action to begin with. In fact, the evidence is overwhelming that the adoption of the Sherman Act and the subsequent regulation that occurred 
uh, produced a situation where prices either started to rise or started to fall at a slower rate than they were falling beforehand. So I, I want to start with that point. Uh, the problem with antitrust laws that don't focus on consumer interest is that they become a license to do whatever you want to do. So when you look at the empirical evidence, there's no evidence that antitrust laws benefited consumers to begin with. Now, the contribution of Judge Bork and a lot of other people, uh, and it was a broad-based intellectual exercise of trying to take the Sherman Act back to what its objective was and should have been to protect the consumer, not to protect the producer. That's right. And that seems to have been lost on a lot of progressives well, these days it, as they discuss it and they want to go, I think while the focus right now on progressives is going after so-called big tech and breaking up companies and you know going after them in a very aggressive way, the policies they are discussing could be applied to all kinds of other industries in energy, um, retail and, and, and some of the policies they're talking about, like for example, not being able to integrate the products the way they currently do, could be a real damage to the consumer in what we've gotten used to using, you know, our smartphones, our, you know, when we're on search online. These services are all integrated and make our life simpler and in many cases it's at no cost or much lower cost. So if these policies are put in place, what type of politicization do you well, think you would see, particularly during a Democrat administration? Of course, it's also coming from the right also. But. Yeah. Well, first of all, no one has ever presented any evidence to prove that the consumer is being hurt by the development of big tech. In fact, it's hard to argue consumers are hurt when they're giving away most of their services. So at its very root here, this is really the old progressive argument that they're too big and they should be broken up. And it's very interesting because it's a movement to the antitrust policy that dominates Europe. Where they don't have where they don't large, have. successful tech companies. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, why are all these new high-tech companies American companies? Well, because that's certainly... Because we let yeah. the process work. So I think to, to do antitrust policy is about protecting the consumer. And unless you can demonstrate that the consumer is being harmed, there's no basis for antitrust policy. What is happening in the House, in my opinion, is you've got a combination of political forces that have nothing to do with consumer benefit. You've got Democrats who believe that tech is simply too big, too powerful, and they ought to be broken up. And uh, if it doesn't benefit the consumer, that's still their policy. And you've got Republicans who basically have taken the policy that we don't like what they're doing on information platforms in terms of deciding what to allow and what not to allow. And so while Which is we're their not, right as a private business to decide yeah, these it things. Is, but, yeah. Yeah, and this is where it becomes a debate. At what point are you big enough that it becomes an issue? And look, the point is you've got an unholy alliance between people who are against big because it's big. And even if consumers benefit from it, uh, they're against it. And then you've got people who feel that this has become a political issue and that there's discrimination against a political viewpoint. And if they've got to tear up an important element of the economy to fix it, they're willing to do it. And one final point I want to add, look, I don't know how you, you measure the impact that high tech has had on our lives. I think just over the past uh, year, you know, what, what it has what done for us. What in the world would we do without iPhones? The point I'm making is, is that they've changed the world we live in and the pandemic shutdown was living proof of it. The economy would have been totally crippled without 
uh, the tech companies. So I think that you're seeing a confluence of political uh, support to try to destroy an industry that is now a very significant part of every retirement fund in America. I mean, when people understand that you, you destroy the tech industry, that you're, you're knocking a quarter off the retirement of all the working people who put their life savings in investments. Well, and as well as our competition with China, the, Ch the China competition and the China threat has been such a big focus, particularly over the past year with the pandemic. And when you look at the top tech companies, they're about half and half U.S. and China, although ours are still in the lead and advancing they are doing a lot of investments. So as, as you pointed out before, the EU and Europe, yeah, you know, they don't right have again. these well, great tech companies. So if we break say, ours up, what is that going to mean for our competition with China? Well, I'm talking too much, but <laughs> let me say that as long as China's got government investing and we've got companies investing, I feel pretty good about the competition. Um, but it, it, it's incredible that because of this confluence of political support, we're debating destroying an indus industry that has it contributed greatly to the well-being of American society. Uh, and in doing so, we're assaulting the retirement savings of tens of millions of our people. So I don't think this has all been thought through, not that there are not problems out there, but this is not the solution. And again, if you don't base antitrust on consumer benefit, it just becomes a license to do whatever you want to do, uh, to engage in central planning, to pick out your enemies and destroy them. I just don't think this thing is being thought through, and I, I find it pretty frightening. And if you make, yeah, and don't, yeah, and yes. if you make the, these new laws that they're talking about, what you're going to do is judges will then be able to begin to insert their own personal exactly. views again. And, and, and uh, as I've said before, then you create a judicial Ouija board and you mm -hmm. don't know, there'll be all this uncertainty and, and, and CEOs will have to basically come to Washington to say, okay, what can I do? And they'll, they'll, they'll fossilize capitalism. And it's really fundamentally you know. misunderstanding how platforms create value for consumers and it kind of takes the consumer well, out of the equation well, unlike, when unlike, they do that. Yeah, unlike Standard Oil and all those old uh, trusts, uh, these companies are, are built on the more users they have, you have this network effect, and it becomes more valuable to me, the consumer, as these companies grow. Uh, but believe it or not, there's a lot of competition between these companies, between them. Yeah, and, they really and ignore that coming. competition, don't yeah. they? They really don't understand how much, because you're always hearing the term monopoly thrown around with these companies who actually compete very aggressively against each other. I think Google has something like 11 serious competitors. Yes. Uh, and Facebook, too. And, you know, it, it, and certainly we saw during the pandemic, Zoom zoomed in and came out of nowhere right. to compete with uh, a lot of other platforms. Exactly. Exactly. So, and you know, one thing you, the senator touched on briefly is there is a real national security problem here that if we bust up all these companies uh, and we set new standards for mergers and acquisitions by not just them, but others, it just creates a gigantic hole for the Chinese to march right through. And don't you think, you know, when you have Congress, and, and certainly I know when you were in Congress, you were not someone who was trying to micromanage the economy. You understood innovation and, and the need for it. And so given we are in this post-pandemic world that is going to be very different, that needs to be consumer driven. You know, consumers and workers are really demanding a lot of different things right now. And wouldn't it be much better for us to stick with this consumer standard at this time when we're going to see so much uh, change in the post-pandemic world? Well that you would think coming out of the sh pandemic shutdown that there would be an awareness of what an incredible contribution high tech made. Uh, I was able to work every day without leaving my house. And my husband's and a teacher I, and he taught from uh, home you know, and hybrid. <laughs> I communicate with my office in London instantaneously without going to the post office without buying a stamp, 
without buying any stationery. Um, do we really want to put that at risk? And in terms of competition, these companies didn't even exist, many of them 25 years ago, and some of them won't exist 25 years from now. Yeah, hasn't that been in the past? You have companies, you think back just maybe 10, 15 years ago, everyone thought MySpace was going to be taking over the world, and then and Facebook came along. Yeah. Or, yeah, exactly. Right. And the it, Justice it, Department and others, you know, on the outside progressives, talked about that threat, the threat of Nokia phones. Right. Pre we are not living in a snapshot in time. We may look, feel like we are sometimes looking around, but things are moving. There are more competitors coming up. Someone's going to invent a different, a better algorithm yeah. or something else. And, and there are, your, your competitor's out of business. It's not, I mean, the, uh, these things change dramatically. And I will say, I think the, the record of the first antitrust movement was not a good record. But at least you can say on the consolidated steel industry that you couldn't go out and open a steel mill uh, in your garage, okay? You can open a business in your garage today that can dominate the world market, uh, at least the piece of it you're in, temporarily, well, certainly until somebody else in their garage in. invents a better product. So it's a more competitive world than it has ever been. Um, now, do you find it strange when you hear conservatives, because as a conservative, basically echoing EU and progressive arguments in their animosity towards tech? And what do you think that you know, makes for the bigger I don't look, innovation I, I think world their view? opposition is based on what they perceive to be censorship. I don't think they believe that breaking up the tech industry is in the national interest. So it's a totally different argument. And I keep trying to explain to people that, look, you need to be aware of the fact that when you pass laws that let the government pick and choose what it wants, uh, that you are empowering government to destroy industries, to pay, play favorites. Right. It becomes a very dangerous kind of situation. Power undefined. And again, I think this is the contribution of the, of the consumer welfare standard. If you can prove that they are hurting the consumer and that the consumer would benefit by breaking that company up, then you've got a standing on a legitimate issue, but just to say, well, I don't like big business or I don't like uh, how people set their standard as to what they run, what they don't run, it's very, very dangerous, whether you agree with their standard or not. Well, and you're not uh, seeing, as you watch these hearings on antitrust and these bills that are coming through um, that the progressives are really pushing, you're not seeing the discussion is rare that you see the discussion of the consumer welfare. As, as, have you been? You know, well, I see it from some people on our side, um, yeah. but I don't see it too much from the other side. Uh, they're not. They're, they've tried to change the definition to total welfare, and that is a nebulous concept that can mean whatever you want to infuse into it, and they will write laws and enforce actions. On a whim, it'll be just the whim of government deciding who and wins and who loses. What has been the record of government in the past, or or these people who predicted, you know, whether you know the MySpaces, the Yahoos? Not that good. I mean, just very recently, AT and T. There was a big fight over AT and T buying uh, Time Warner, and they lost. Uh, the government took them on in court, and they lost. And guess what? The market worked. Uh, AT and T had was basically had to divest much of its media properties because. They didn't know what they didn't know how to handle it. Well, and that's an important thing. Often, what so is the market missed works. by the progressives is there are laws right now in place. There's very there's very active uh, Justice Department antitrust division yes. that often doesn't get credit for when there are pure you know go, going after predatory conduct. There is action on that front. The FTC yes. also is investigating these companies. In fact, when they've gone after tech companies in the past, the tech companies have been successful because they have found that 
uh, the consumer welfare standard was, you know, the, the government had has, been, has had a difficult time in, in many cases making an economic case that there is going to be harm. And then the courts follow what has been the rule of law for the last 43 years and say, sorry, you know, we're not breaking up that company. We're not stopping that merger. But, you know, there are, actually what you don't hear about are a lot of the mergers that don't happen because the government investigates mm. and stops it before, you know, they're stillborn. Uh, and again, post-pandemic, that could be a problem because as you have consolidation and, and real fundamental changes in businesses, you're going to need that merger yeah. necessity. You remember the, you know, the government didn't want Blockbuster and Hollywood Video to, <laughs> to merge. That was going to take over the world. And then, of yes. course, Netflix came out of nowhere. Right. And, and now exactly. we have streaming wars and have all kinds of I think the government has a very, very, very bad track sure. record of predicting things. And one of the funny things now is, it's not funny, in the, the laws that are being proposed is they are going to demand that companies prove that there won't be any harm down the road yeah. in a merger. You know, yeah, that's and, some of the bills. That's like pre-crime, yeah. you know? Yeah. Prove you're not guilty in Well, advance. It's, it, it can be virtually impossible to do. And even, you know, in predatory pricing, you got to prove that not only is competition being hurt, but that the objective in hurting competition is to get the ability to raise prices in the future more than enough to pay you back for what you lost with the predatory pricing. And again, unless you're focused on the consumer, I mean, you can argue Costco is the big predator. I mean, look at all the people they put out of business by selling good stuff cheap. And so, well, now the, you have those, the, you know, they have generics. They, they, yeah, a lot of and things the very and then, things that But now some of these bills consumers. are going to go after yeah. tech companies for doing the same Look, thing. Look, the consumer welfare standard is democratic with a small d. It's not conservative. It's not yeah, liberal. Right. It's not Republican or Democrat. It's, it's democratic with a small d. It's based on the fact that people vote with their dollars, vote with their feet, and decide where they want to go. My grandmother, my father's mother, used to complain about the corner grocery store in New Haven, Connecticut, and how it was going out of business. And we asked her where she was shopping. Well, she went to the supermarket because they yeah, had more choice and better Everybody prices. Else does. <laughs> yeah. right. But if you have people come in and start over-regulating, what is going to be the impact at a time when we're seeing artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things would help us stay in our homes longer, help us get health care to hard-to-reach places or hard-to-reach people? Um, what is, you know, how is that going to impact the consumer? Well, it's pretty severely, I think, particularly, you know, they start busting up these companies and you have to start uh, paying for different pieces of the service you used to get all together. Um, yeah, you're thinking like if you can be at home and you can control your lights and you can turn, you know, you can lock your doors if you've forgotten, particularly thinking, you know, of an elderly person who doesn't want to get up in the middle of the night because they forgot to lock the door. You know, we now have these things and if you start breaking them up and saying these things can't be you put know, together. Uh, these are, I think that's an interesting argument. I think the bigger argument though, it really is uh, the overall benefit to the consumer. We keep coming back to that. Whether these, there's some little service and you can turn your lights on and off, that's all fine. <laughs> but the bottom line is, are we providing uh, opportunity for companies to grow, to create jobs, to provide products at a, at a, at a price uh, at a good price with quality, that's all, a be all the benefit of the consumer welfare standard is tied up in that. And if you screw it around with that, you're going mm -hmm. to end up really taking a big bite out of the economy. You've got, yeah. you've got a real danger here that imperils the retirement of working people, that in, imperils our leadership in the world mm -hmm. in an industry that we dominate. And the, the Chinese system is not a good system to be developing new technology. It's and, and ultimately, it's going to kill them. Um, it, I'm sort of by technology the way Lincoln was about threats to America's life. We're the only people that are capable of destroying our economic domination of the world. We can do it. But nobody else can do it. We're not going to be out competed by China. Uh, central planning, if it worked, we would have knocked down the Berlin Wall to get into Eastern Europe. 
if we kill off competition, we will lose our world leadership. And only we can do that. Now, we've talked about how, you know, in these days of, um, you know, investment portfolios, you see every day the stories of the tech industry because we're leaders are, is driving our investments. What would be the impact on, you know, college funds, on our retirement funds, on, you know, federal employees' uh, retirement funds? You know, these, all, all of these funds out there are heavily well, invested in what are our dominant world-leading industries. Well, just remember, 25% of the rise in the stock market in the last 20 years has come from tech. Um, there's no major retirement fund, whether it's uh, TIAA, CREF, or any of the, the companies that manage retirement funds that does not invest heavily in technology. Uh, so all know, of those members of Congress who have their thrift yeah, their, uh, uh, fund, the, they, they are invested. They're invested <laughs> in technology. And, uh, you know, you, um, uh, you, you look at these companies and the people that founded the companies that, that were the original stockholders, they may own 7 to 10 percent of the stock. But 60 percent or so belongs to 401ks, pension plans, IRA plans, uh, annuities, or uh, assets that back up life insurance. So when you're talking about destroying industries that are probably a quarter of all the retirement funds in America, you're talking about a pretty profound change. Now, it's one thing uh, when you you got plenty of money to talk about doing that, but when you think about the people who worked a lifetime to invest this money so they can have a decent retirement, and you're going to end up destroying that value uh, because of a political dispute. It's pretty damn serious business. And pretty often, serious uh, business. Bob, you know, while Congress talks about the need to invest in research and development and technology so we continue to be world leaders, um, they are ignoring often that these these major companies, you know, the the top tech companies, are the major investors in R and D. Correct. They, I Absolutely. know I, when I was in Congress, I oversaw the budget for some you know technology um, agencies and government, and they weren't nearly as large as the ones in big tech. What would happen, you know, with with breakups? That would be a real um, it's, hit. It's on unimaginable. The it's unimaginable. And the fact is, a lot of these companies have grown and the, and, and the and people who own the stock take their wealth and they put it into other great new ideas. We, we wouldn't be going to the, to the space station or to the moon right now if it weren't for the billions, the billions invested in the pri private right, sector. the private sector coming out of the wealth created by these big tech companies. Yeah, it's not that they invest more than the government. They do it better. It's that they do it so much better. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, you, you should get worried when the government is saying, oh, we're going to keep our lead in tech because we're going to invest all this money. Well, you know, we're not going to out-Chinese the Chinese. Yeah, well, they do the top down. Yeah, Ours has always uh, and, been the garage up. Uh, the, uh, and our companies that are successful have uh, been. We need to lead, let markets work. Let people keep money to invest. We don't need the government to raise our taxes to invest our money for us. Where is the record that government has ever invested anything uh, better than the private sector? The private sector investments have created a huge amount of private equity ownership. What is public investment created? $21 trillion of national debt. That's, that's their payoff. Well, and if we're going to get out of this debt that we're now facing, we certainly need the innovation Absolutely. and the new industries that, that our technology companies spin off all the time. I mean, often it's ignored that these companies, you know, people who work there, get a lot of training, you right. know, because they're always upscaling well, the their criticism, workforce. The criticism is that they buy things and they crush competition. but they. <laughs> Uh, first of all, though, I think most of those acquisitions were, you know, they didn't, they didn't go in and at a gunpoint and take things over. 
they, they improved the products that they bought and the services that they bought. But then those things, uh, those companies spin off other things, other companies, and you're right. That's, you know, more jobs, more innovation. When you look at, you know, I know, go back to, you know, during the pandemic, you have things, say, our restaurants were, have gone online now, and they did, you know, pick up. And you had, you know, whether it was Google or other, you know, technology companies were helping them continue their businesses through that. You know, aren't there a lot of new things coming out of the pandemic that we don't even know where they're going to go? Exactly. I don't have an example, but I know there are many. <laughs> well, we say DoorDash and, you know, all oh, of well, these new that. companies right. are, that are all, in, and they're all competing I'm a now. and customer. Yeah, and we're, I <laughs> get the imported ones, we don't know at all. Right. Um, the, uh, again, it's like politicians predicting the future. <laughs> it's, it's a joke. Well, last question. Um, what would you like to leave with people today about the importance of this antitrust discussion and, and why we need to take this really seriously and put the consumer back in the forefront? I, I think the answer is about as simple as it could be. If consumer welfare is not the objective, then you've put a blank space there that government can fill in however it wants to. So whether it's Democrats or Republicans, whether someone's going to have their or rock scored. Republicans, they can use antitrust for central planning. They can use antitrust to punish enemies. They can use antitrust to garner support. It's very dangerous to give government power that is not strictly focused and limited. It's the whole genius of the American Constitution. And that's the danger we face in, in dealing with fear of bigness and fear of censorship. We could end up with a system that greatly empowers government and in the process destroys the both those things. consumer and, our, and our, the vibrancy exactly. of our economy. And what, what would you like to well, I, let the them know about the importance of Senator, Judge Bork's conserva conservative mainstream consumer welfare Well, it's funny standard. you should say mainstream. Uh, <laughs> Senator Graham remembers, and I'm sure you do too, when my father was nominated to the Supreme Court, that they were jumping up and down, screaming and yelling that he was out of the mainstream. Well, he invented with others, the <laughs> antitrust mainstream that has been so beneficial to us yeah. for the last 40, almost 50 years. And these people who are trying to change all that, they are the fringe now, and they have, uh, they're have they trying to take a good idea that has worked and destroy it for political reasons. Instead of keeping the consumer at the, the at, center. At the and, center. And the consumer welfare standard has been a great friend and partner for our innovation economy, which is we're continuing to lead the world. Yeah, and if, if I can just add one thing, government has nothing to fear from the consumer welfare standard. In fact, it is a beneficiary of the wealth that is created, the taxes that it gets to, to, uh, to you know, garner from all that wealth that's been created and all the jobs that are created. Uh, I think sometimes government should just say, wait a second, Let's just get out of the way and let the economy work and let good ideas work. Because the more innovation we have the and the freedom. more thriving economy we have, yeah. we will be able to deal with yeah. that debt faster. The problem faster. is, if, con if the consumer is king, what is government? They want to be king. And that's the competition. This is the competition between people and government. The you know, we talk about this is the people's house. Uh, democracy is government of the people. The consumer is the people. If you're not promoting the consumer's benefit, whose benefit are you? Don't you think, I think, promoting? you know, I, I've got three kids and they've got young families and they are used to controlling their lives, having much more control over their lives because of technology. How do you think young people are going to respond to either party who tries to start taking away these tools that have been you know, so much a part of their lives and give them more access to information, more convenience, and more control over their I, lives. I think at first they'll be happy, though, you know, they, they sort of resent bigness, but they're going to see some real world, world results that are going to make them very unhappy in short order. Yeah, I think the problem is the truth sets you free when you know the truth. Right. I think it's easy to deceive people. 
in convincing them that big is bad. Uh, and uh, they don't see the damage until it's too late. 